If you love podcasting as much as Erica and I do, you may be considering starting your own. Starting a podcast has been one of the best decisions we have ever made, but getting started can feel overwhelming. Buzzsprout is the easiest and most professional way to start a podcast. Buzzsprout has helped over 100,000 people launch their own, including us. Buzzsprout will launch your show on all of the major podcast platforms like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Play, to name a few. You also get a podcast website, audio players that can be dropped into other websites, and stats of who is listening, and so much more. Buzzsprout also publishes blog posts, podcasts, and YouTube videos every week. They are a great tool and have useful information from expert podcasters. To start your own podcast and get a $20 Amazon gift card, follow the link in our show notes. This lets Buzzsprout know that we sent you and it supports our show. Buzzsprout, the easiest way to start a podcast. Crime, Wine, and Chaos contains adult language and graphic content. Listener discretion is advised. Hey listeners, I'm Amber. And this is Allison. And this is Crime, Wine, and Chaos. Dun, dun, dun! so excited. I'm excited to have you here. I'm so nervous. You are? Oh my gosh. A little bit. A little bit. I've been like running through the scripts Mm -hmm. in my head and like it's just crazy. So yeah, but I've had so much fun researching this. Really? I am so excited to share the story. Well, you're one of the best storytellers I know. I do love me some storytelling. You're very animated and very theatrical (laughs) and you're good at it. Do you want to tell people about yourself? Like, shh. Or is that uncomfortable? Why not? <laughs> oh, come on. You know me? <laughs> You're like, yes, please. That's what I dream of. <laughs> Maybe not quite loud. <laughs> okay. Please let me tell you about myself. Pull up a All chair. about me. No. <laughs> You're in for a good tale. No. Um, <laughs> I'm Allison. Mm-hmm. I've been, we've been good friends for I don't even know how many years. Yes. I'm the notorious Allison that woke you up at 11 o'clock at night. Stop with it. your... <laughs> favorite conversation in the whole world and just to launch an insult at me and then love you nay nay <laughs> so the funniest part was the look on your face i mean where you're like all pleasant but tired and you know the half smile and as i keep going on and on about how much your life sucks <laughs> oh God. you just have this look of confusion of like why is she telling me all this <laughs> took a hard left I thought it maybe it was a fever dream, but well, <laughs> no, it took a hard laugh. Well, it was one of those nights with maybe a little more consumption that should have happened. I you love, know. oh my God, I love a good drunk call. Well, you've been mentioned ad nauseum on this podcast oh, as, you know, the third amigo right. of the amigos. Yeah. And the mermaid hair and sure. all of the mm-hmm. things. Yeah. And then when I'm trying to conceal your identity, I think I one time was like, you know, our friend it rhymes with palace. Yeah, it's like, that's not a word. <laughs> and that was, wasn't that the one you were trying to also talk about the ex and you were trying to talk about the ex's oh, yes. hat? Yeah. And I was like, no, it should have been shat. Yes. <laughs> yes. Rhymes with shat. God. Oh, oh man. such good times. Mm-hmm. Yes. You're welcome. Mm-hmm. Welcome for remaining or maintaining your confidentiality. Oh, your, I well, now privacy. it's the cat's out of the bag. You know, the alley here, cat is out of the out bag. Out of the bag. Here you are. <laughs> in the flesh. I love it. I love Thank it. you for co-hosting with me. I'm so excited. Mm. I've actually been working on a story because I know you're like, what's new? What's all this stuff? Right. Uh-huh. And Erica already do that. Yeah. Always do that. So the other day I was driving home from um picking up a rent a car, right? Mm-hmm. And for one thing, I think it's a big gas scam because I got like a quarter of a tank in my rent a car. Mm-hmm. And I think they're playing to those people who are obsessive that can't drive on a quarter of a tank. Oh. Because they're like, oh, just return it with this much. Well, you know I'm gonna and I don't know how long I'm gonna have the car. Yeah. So you know I'm gonna put like more gas in it. You're you know? nervous you're gonna oh, run yeah. out. Yeah. So guaranteed they're gonna come back with more gas than of course. it left with. So mm-hmm. I, you know, you're welcome enterprise. You know, so oh, fuck off. I know. It should be standard that it's just a full tank. I agree. Wow. I totally agree. Hmm. But so yeah, they did end up with more gas than I oh. took it with. But yeah. um I should have asked for credit for that. You should now, have. Right? With gas prices these days. Yeah. I know, right? You should have. So that's not the story. Mm-hmm. But um mm-hmm. So as I was driving home, right, and you know how the Google Maps, they show those, like, red lines, right? The bad zone. Right. Mm -hmm. And you're expecting, like, all this massive traffic to be there. Mm -hmm. But then, like, when you're coming around the corner 
and you see like basically nothing and you're like, wait a minute. And you're approaching this, like what's going on, Google? Like what, what is this? Is this like a ghost bus <laughs> that's parked here that all of a sudden I'm going to run into and four spirits are going to be attached to me Ooh, and take me good. responsibility oh. for, you know, completing some last minute thing that <laughs> sure. they weren't able to complete because the dress bus driver didn't tell them. Right. And I'm, you know, have these spirits haunting me singing, you know, walk like a man and all this stuff. So I'm like, is that what spirits do? They sing. You've seen the heart and souls movie, right? Is that with Robert Downey Jr.? Yes. Okay. Yes. So thank you for picking yes. up the movie. Recipes. Thank you. Oh. Yes. <laughs> so that's what I'm thinking. You know, I'm like, Hey, maybe this will be a cool thing. I'm like, all right, ghost bus, bring it on. And then as I'm going through this area and I'm getting home and I'm like, you know what? Maybe this isn't such a good idea because with my luck, I'd open the door and there'd be like furniture moving across the floor and Stop plates it. crashing against the wall. Probably. <laughs> and some boys going, get out. <laughs> oh my God. Do you have that sage I got you still? <laughs> I do. You sage the fuck out of that place. I know. Oh I am God. not as trusting of portals anymore. <laughs> After the incident. I know. Oh, that yeah. was some creepy stuff. That was creepy stuff. That whole experience was weird. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The antenna jumpers. The antenna Yeah. Well, I'm not outdoorsy. I don't oh. know if you know. Well, I'm not super rustic. Oh, honey, you made that very clear when we were going. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm sorry. We're in the woods. I can't even with this girl. She freaking calls me up, what, 5.30 in the morning? She's like, you've got to come and look because I think I've got bed bugs. And I'm like, what? And I go, and there's just these tiny, like, like look like fruit flies, right? And Amber's like, but they have antennas. If they have antennas, <laughs> and they jump. And I'm like, okay, so hence the name antenna jumpers. And then she calls the guy from the desk to come over about the bugs. And he's like, well, ma'am, we are outdoors in the woods. I'm sorry, but they were clearly looking at me. They looked at me. I slept in the you kitchen chair. See those eyes? You must have like super eyes. I woke up to and see we those made tiny direct eye to eye contact. <laughs> so bad. I slept in the kitchen chair. Did you really? Yes. <laughs> like oh my god it's like a gnat it's not nope. <laughs> fucking it looked at me it <laughs> mocked me it hogged the bed i was like i'm out of here oh my god and this is too not much. <laughs> where's too the much. four seasons this is not what i signed up for oh okay my i should have gotten a girl scout pouch patch for that <laughs> for the weekend <laughs> survived in tana jumpers just fucking survive, period. <laughs> that, those were posh cabins. Okay. No, oh, they were. Come on. They were, but they there, was were. A, there was bugs. Anyway. It was in the woods. Okay, well, <sighs> that was a very misleading weekend. Oh. <laughs> you know. Oh, you know. Cheers to that. Huh? Cheers to that. <laughs> oh, speaking of cheers, what are we drinking? Yes. Well, you tell me, because mm-hmm. you, you've been the supplier today. Okay. Um, we're drinking Attico. Uh, Tempranillo Monastrelli from Spain. <laughs> Just rolls Nailed right it. Off. Just rolls right <laughs> off the tongue. Tempranillo <laughs> Monastrelli <laughs> from Spain. It's delicious. It is delicious. Uh, I don't know Spain. Well, I can't. Muy bien. <laughs> um, sure. <laughs> That's Spanish. <laughs> it is Spanish. Okay. Um, <laughs> It's delicious. And I think you have crime. Yeah, I do. I do. So uh uh-huh. my story is about Chester Gillette and Grace Brown. And this is the story that was the inspiration for the American tragedy. Okay. It's either the great American tragedy or the American tragedy. It is a classic. There's no way to know. <laughs> Those <laughs> List not for me right at this moment. <laughs> at the end of the story, I have it written down, but I don't want to rest. I understand. I yes. understand. Okay. Um, is it related to the Gillette razors at all? He, it was, a, his uncle was a part of the Gillette skirt factory. Okay. Which is where they met. So okay. Interesting. I don't know if it eventually down the line transitioned into that, but. Okay. That's was my, I know I was like, what? Well, yeah. That's of course what you first think of. Mm-hmm. Okay. And gen- here we go. So, on a cold, dark, I'm uncomfortable, stormy night. <laughs> Actually, I don't know what the weather oh. was like. I was like, um, 
<laughs> on August 9th, okay, 1883, Fuck. Uh, Wicks, Montana, uh, Chester Gillette was born in Wicks, Montana. Okay. And his family was pretty well off. Um, and he was apparently a troubled child since like one years old. Oh, he no. was running away and stealing stuff and just getting into all kinds of trouble. A one year old? Yeah. Oh my God. I know. Okay. So his mom and dad got into a religion and they basically kind of renounced whatever money they had and joined the Red Cross. Okay. And Chester, they kind of thought to send him to college, you know, and help maybe help him to kind of get more Normal. Normal. Yeah. <laughs> Some structure. There we go. Sure. That's the word. Structure in his life. Uh-huh. And he had a well-off uncle, the uncle that owned the skirt factory, who put him through college. Well, the first year, he did great. Like, he was a part of all these things. And and then the second year, the college actually wrote their parents to his parents and said, you know what? It's kind of pointless for him to be here oh because he was missing classes. He was getting in all kinds of trouble. It was just, yeah. They're like, please get your kid out of here. Thank you. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> God, pretty that's much. Pretty bad. We're done with him. You need to take him back now. You're his parents. He's yeah, your we're, responsibility. We're yeah. Wow. Uh, <laughs> so after that, he jumped around, worked at different places and... Like, one of them was a railroad or whatever. But he finally decided to go work for his uncle's skirt factory. Okay. The Gillette Skirt Factory in Cortland, New York. Okay. So, this is where he met Grace. Mm. Now, Grace was born March 20th, 1886. And she was raised on a farm. Her family was pretty well, you know, to do with the farmers. Did well at that. And uh, people called her Billy. She went by Billy, yeah, because she would always be singing, Won't You Come Home, Bill Bill, Bill Bailey. Oh, yeah. Interesting. And I know, right? Oh, cute. Okay. I know. So she's a cutie. She's a cutie. <laughs> she sings Bill Bailey. Sure. And so she'd sign her letters, Billy or the kid, you know, <laughs> you know, Billy the kid. Uh-huh. No, no, I got it. I'm picking up what you're throwing. No now. laugh at all. No. no. <laughs> Sorry, Grace, your extra signature wasn't funny to Amber. So, anyways. I feel such deep shame. So, basically, this is where Chester and Grace uh, met. Okay. At the skirt factory. Mm -hmm. So, Chester was Mr. Rico Suave around town. Like, he was good looking. He was athletic. He, you know, came from the money or at least looked like he did, you know. And all of that. And Grace basically fell in love to his charms. Sure. And he was also a man around town. Mm. So when they were dating, he never took her out anywhere. He never was seen with her. He oh. never mentioned her. He wanted to carry himself as single still. Right. What a right. douche. Dude. And they dated for a year. What a douche. With that stuff. All right. Oh, it he gets douchier. Oh, great. Oh, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so in May of 1906, uh, Grace found out she was pregnant. Uh oh. Mm-hmm. Mm. And she told Chester, and basically his response was like, "And what a dick!" I know. Didn't want to do anything <coughs> about it. Didn't nothing. Right. Mm-hmm. And she continued to see, like, she kept on pressuring him, like, please marry me. We've got to do this. I'm going to be ashamed. I can't tell my parents. We've got to. And after about a month of that and him doing nothing, as well as seeing other women, Uh you know, Grace is like, all right, I got to go back to my parents. And while she was there, she was, like, extremely depressed. And she was sick and she was losing weight, oh. and she was writing him these letters, you know, like, that were devastating. And one of them um, says, my life is ruined, and in a measure, yours too. The world and you, too, may think that I am the one to blame, but somehow I can't, just simply can't, think that I am. I said no so many times. Oh, God. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And he even admitted in court that he pressured her what until she said yes. What a piece of shit. Like, why? Honestly, why? If you don't have any intention of dating the girl, uh huh. And but you still won't give up on it. Because some people just want to put their dick in something. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> yeah. Shocking. Shocking. Shocking that we're what uh, more than a century later, and this is still happening. Okay. I don't. Not really shocking. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But so she also, it was said, was kind of a plain girl. Um, but then the picture they show is she looks nice, you know. Mm-hmm. So. That's another thing that's like really people like oh how could he be with her she's plain and whatever I so fucking hate everything uh, right okay. so she was trying to get Chester to propose to her and I think it was like the eighteenth to fifteenth of June yes. okay he shows up and he ends up at night like nine hour clock at night or something picks her up in this horse drawn carriage drives her to this lake they didn't go to the hotel they went past the hotel to the barn. And Chester asks for a round bottom boat. And the guy says, no, we only have a flat bottom boat. So they go out onto the lake. They're not there for very long. And they come back. And when they came back, the lady was crying. Hmm. Right. So there's a little bit that I found on this where the witness described the young lady at, with like a black hat, tall black hat. Mm-hmm. And Grace's sister said she didn't have a hat like that. And then when a picture was, like, drawn up or something, like, the father said, yes, she has a resemblance to Grace, right? Right. And it never, in one of the things it said that they didn't know, like, what picture they showed to this witness. They didn't say it was an actual picture or to their dad. If if it was an actual picture, if it was a sketch drawing, if it was a black and white picture, they just said that, oh, yeah, that resembles Grace. So they're saying this is... Chester and Grace. Okay. Interesting. So, I know. But that, to me, is like, okay. Keep that in mind as we move Put a pin in that. Right. Put Mm -hmm. a pin in that. Okay. So, it gets to the point where, okay, so she's still writing stuff. And it's like, she says, if I could only die, I know how you feel about this affair. And I wish for your sake, you need not be troubled. If I die, I hope you can be happy. I hope I can die. Jeez. So a lot of her, yeah, she says, this is the last letter I can write, dear. My parents think I am just going out there to Derudi for a... Lake Derudi? <laughs> what? You think Erica's bad at pronouncing words? I'm worse. Mm. Remember Babara? Mm. So... I'll never forget Babara. <laughs> oh, it's the best thing I've ever heard. So... <laughs> It was supposed to be Barbara, just to mm. let the listeners know. <laughs> um, so <laughs> it's spelled D E R O, or wait, U Y T E R. So not even close to what I, I just have said. no idea what that word is. But you know what? We're going to Derudi. Yep. It ends in an E R, so Derudi is. Yes, that place. So she says they're going for a visit. I have been biting my goodbyes to some places today. I know I shall never see any of them again. And Mama, if I come back dead, perhaps she, if she does not know, she won't be angry with me. I will never be happy again, dear. And she begs for Chester to give her that just one evening for that. And, um, okay. It was Little York Lake. Found it. Okay. Yes. (laughs) So... That happened after that. Then he goes back, and she keeps on sending him stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And so finally, he agrees to do a date of the 7th. But then he wants to delay it again because he's always been pushing her off, right? Right. So she says, like, she finally is like, all right, listen, buddy. And she says, in your last letter, you said you could get away for, for the trip the 7th of July. And in tonight's letter, you say June, July 9th. I expect any time to hear you can't come for a week or two, yet I am awfully sorry. But I have planned on Saturday the 7th, and I shall be in Cortland that night. So, he pulls his Rico Fra- Suave crap and mm-hmm. convinces her to go on the 9th. Um, yeah. But a lot of her letters, and it was said, too, like, while she was in Cortland, she would talk to her um, co-workers and say, like, I just want to die. I never want to see the sun again. Aww. And, you know, all of these things that she just really was not in a good, happy no. place. Right? Yeah. I know. And so when before she left, she packed up, like, all of her belongings. Okay. Like, everything. She had a big old trunk. Like, she was planning to go get married and move on with life. Yeah. Right? Aww. 
I know. And I think it mentioned somewhere that some people may have thought that she was going to a home for unwed mothers. Okay. Right? Or maybe that's what her family thought she was doing. Because at this point, does do they does her parents know she's pregnant? Like, she, is I she showing? I don't think so. Okay. No, because she's only, like, three months along. Okay. Basically. Wow. Yeah. So, May 6th. So, May. Ju- yeah. June, July. Yeah. Okay. So, three months along. Wow. Yes. Chester, however, mm-hmm. didn't really pack anything. Oh, okay. Right. Well, he packed. Sorry. He did bring a suitcase, a tennis racket, an umbrella, and a camera. Okay, okay. Chester. Yeah. And he also, I guess, had gotten into religion there in Cortland. So he was, like, helped out at the church. And he told people there, like, okay, here's what you need to do until I get back. Mm-hmm. So she's packing like she's come, never coming back. He's packing like he's coming back. Okay. Right. Got it. So they, okay, here's where it gets complicated. I, so many times with the train stations and the ports and all the things. So they, they headed on June 9th to the D town. Sure. And Chester got there at the, on the 8th and he checked himself in, or to, at the Tarber house and registered himself as Charles George. So not his real name. Uh huh. Grace arrives the following day and they heard on, or they head out on the train to Canastotle. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> and he stays very much away from Grace while they're in the station. Like, not next to her, kind of hiding behind walls, not wanting to stick into the shadows, you know. Yeah. All this stuff. Right. And once they board the train, they sit in separate cars. Okay. Yes. So, on this train, there were two young ladies from Cortland that were starting a journey to the Fulton Chain of Lakes in Herc... I should have so looked up how these things were. No, it's all right. Herc... Hercules. Hercules in Hercules County. Perfect. And <laughs> these young ladies were acquaintances and friends mm. of Chester's. Oh. Yes. And soon after the train left, he came to their seats in the car and stayed there until the train reached Canis Dota. Okay. It's Dota. And while they were on the trains, the ladies are chatting about how they're going to be going up to these lakes. And he's like, oh, yeah, you know, maybe I can meet up with you guys on Friday or Saturday, you know. What a dick. Right. Yes. And so they're like, oh, yeah. And apparently with this, like, he's not keeping himself not seen, right? These yeah. ladies know him. Mm-hmm. So, and he told them that he was coming there to... um coming there to meet a young man and that that young man had gone and he was proceeding to Canastata to meet this young man and accompany him to the North Woods. Okay. He said that this young man and his uncle on Racket Lake and a camp there and he thought he would have a better time if he met the young man and went with him. What? What? It's what was written about this conversation. Wow. I know. It's, He's not even a good liar. It doesn't even make sense. Oh, just wait. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just wait. What are we talking about, Chester? Oh, okay. I know. So, at Utica that morning, he went to the laundry and left a package of clothing to be washed and directed the laundryman to forward the pack- package, when done, to Chester Gillette, his name, in Old Forge, New York. Thus, it was clearly demonstrated that at the time the de- Fendit had in mind to appear at Old Forge within a few days under his proper name. Okay. It should be remembered that Old Forge was one of the two points of departure from the railroad train for the point where the two young ladies from Cortland were stopping on Seventh Lake. Okay. Okay. All right. So they're planning on stopping there. He's he planning is too. on stopping uh-huh. there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So they reached Tupper Lake in Franklin County at 5.05 p.m., a trunk, which Grace had brought with her from home, was discharged from this train to, at, to Tupper Lake, uh, showing that when the defendant left Utica, their baggage was checked through to Tupper Lake. Okay. Thus, it appears beyond question that about the same hour when the defendant meditated appearing at Old George, mm-hmm. Forge, sorry, sometime during the week as Chester Gillette and appearing at Seventh Lake as Chester Gillette to keep 
his appointment with the two young ladies from Cortland, he also intended to be at Tupper Lake on the night, night of the 10th under the name Charles George and wife. New York, New York. Oh. By which name he registered at the hotel at which he stopped. they stopped at Tupper Tucker Lake Village. Okay. Mm -hmm. So while they were up at Tupper Lake, it said that he bullied his way to get, get get a room. The owner there said, you know, I can only do you for one night. And he approaches the proprietor at the hotel and asks if there was any nice lakes or high mountains about. The proprietor told him that there were none near the village, but suggested Racket Lake. He asked if he could recommend a quiet hotel. He said that he and his wife had been in the mountains and needed a rest. The proprietor couldn't recommend a hotel, but Chester said that they would leave for Racket Lake in the morning, which they did not end up doing. Okay. Okay. So Chester lied about where they had been and where they were going. Okay. Obviously, had a wee bit to hide on that one. So mm -hmm. 7.30 the next morning, the defendant, Chester, sorry, and Grace leave this place and they return to New York Central Station. The trunk of Grace was forward, forwarded onto Old Forge. Okay. Okay. But, and then he had them, but they made a stop at Big Moose, um, the Big Moose Station. And this is where I get confused because at some point during this from Tucker, Tupper Lake to Old Forge and Big Moose Lake is right in the middle. Mm -hmm. Somewhere along the way, he bought two postcards. He, on his, he sent it back to Cortland to his, um, one of his co-workers. Okay. Asking him to fire, forward him $5. By the way, he took $25 with him before they left. So, they, and then Grace, he gives one to Grace and he says, oh, hey, write home, Right. So she writes home and says, Dear Mother, I'm having a lovely time. Don't worry. We'll write you more tonight about the trip. It was rather unexpected, but I'm glad we are here. Love to all the girls and have them in school. Lovingly, Billy. Oh. So I'm thinking it was Moose Lake. Okay. Because it, as it moves forward and they get to this Moose Lake Lodge, uh, yeah, the card was posted at Big Moose Lake July 11th, okay. 1906. Got and it. received at the girl's home July 12th. Okay. So, they get to the place. And Chester, once again, checks them under a different names. And he was saying, he it's like Chester Gordon or something like that, or uh -huh. Clark Gordon. And in the trial, he says, you know, they're like, why did you register under these different names then? And he's like, oh, it matched the initials on my luggage. What? God, this guy is fucking stupid. <laughs> so, um, so, doesn't your real name match the initials on your luggage? Right, right. It, okay. And I should add the Tupper Lake Hotel. Um, Grace was seen crying and they were seen arguing. Okay. And Aww. yeah, yeah. So not a good. Where she kind of headed out thinking this was going to end up in a proposal. Yeah. You know, which Tupper Lake was a perfect place to have a wedding and do all yeah. the things. You know, obviously, That's the worst part is that she's excited and thinks that he's finally coming around, and he just has something nefarious planned. It's crazy, and she was nineteen. Oh my god! I know, nineteen when they met. So obviously, back then, that's like being forty-five, oh. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> We're the new 19, Allie. I'm glad, yes, right. I'm maybe in my twenties then. Um, yeah. So. So once they get okay, so here's the thing. Are you too. sweating balls? I I a little bit. A wee bit. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, you're totally fine. Mm -hmm. I'm used to this stuff. My apartment, right? I know. Oh, I know. Lordy. This room though is it's brutal. It's, okay, it's happy place. It's, it's like we're gonna start doing like the sweat yoga. Sure. <laughs> Hot yoga. There you're we welcome. go. Okay. So on alighting from the train at Big Moose Lodge, they were approached by a busman who asked the defendant where they wanted to go. He said he wanted to go to the Big Moose Lake, and on being asked at what hotel, he answered oh, any old hotel would do that had boats to rent and was near the lake. Mm. The defense, er, so Chester and Grace were the only passengers from the station to the lake, a distance of two or three miles. 
She and Chester had little conversation together on the way. The young woman asked the driver what train they could take going south that night. And on being told that there were none until about 11 o'clock, she said in the presence of the of Chester, oh, dear, I will be tired out before that time. Hmm. So I'm guessing like, I don't know, 11 o'clock afternoon or 11 o'clock at night. Yeah. They don't say an AM or PM in this oh. bullshit. And oh, in this bullshit? <laughs> okay. So she, when she got out of the bus, she said to the driver, don't forget us. We want to take that train. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So, so they arrived at the Glenmore Hotel on Big Moose Lake. And even though Grace's trunk was on the way to Old Forge, Chester checked them in again. Only this time he used his great, uses Grace's full name. Okay. And registers himself under Carl Graham of Albany. <sighs> He's so weird. Okay. This will all come to light later. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, I'll just say, so the theory is basically, because him sending the postcard, him registering her under her name, is so that when she's found, her parents will know where she is. Okay. And it will be assumed, because it's all these different names, that she was with somebody else. God, he's so and fucking stupid, though. I mean... Oh, just wait. Okay. <laughs> that she's just gallivanting around with all these different men. Yeah. And if you're going to be, like, staying at a hotel for a night, why don't you have your trunk with you? Why wouldn't you have your trunk there? Why would you even stop at a place yeah. between? Yeah. Like, but he had his suitcase. I wonder what she's thinking, though. Like, right? why are you taking me to all these places? I don't even... Well, because I think she was waiting for a proposal, and she was trying to get one out of them. And well, yeah, but she doesn't have her stuff, and they're just, like, hotel hopping? I it's Well, they did spend the night a couple of times. The two times, right? Mm-hmm. And she had her stuff with her then, or she had it at Tupper Lake, right? But, like, if you're planning to go to a hotel, it, and they check them, at, but they don't... They don't... Yeah, I just well, wonder if she's starting to get, to get nervous. Like, what are you doing? Oh, I, I feel like she's not. just so I young. Hope not. I know. that would just be scarier. I know. Okay. That would be... Ugh. I know. So, <laughs> so basically when they get there, um, he puts the... He puts Grace's hat on the hat rack in the hall. Mm-hmm. And he takes his hat and coat... Which was this like straw thing, right, with the black band, and his suitcase, and his tennis racket, and his umbrella, and his camera. Fucking weirdo. Okay. And gets a round boat, mm-hmm. and tells the the guy there, the proprietor, that he, you know, was wanting to rent a boat, and it was said something that. Uh, they were planning on doing a steamboat, but then the proprietor convinced them into doing a round bottom boat. Okay. And I don't know if that's what Chester said happened, mm-hmm. but you know what I mean? Sure. Oh, we were going to do something else, but. What's you know. a round bottom boat? It's, it's, <clears throat> it has a round bottom. Okay. And it's <laughs> so far so good. <laughs> it's a Is boat. it a motorboat? Do you row it? No, not back in the 18 and 19. Didn't sense, you just I say steamboat? Think. Don't they have like. Cool that was a steamboat, but. Not a, it was a rowboat. A it rowboat. was a rowboat. Okay, got We're it. just going to go with that. Okay, okay. sounds good. <laughs> with round bottom. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> mm-hmm. so he's saying basically to the proprietor, like, oh, we're going to take the boat out for the day and then we'll come back after dinner, right? Okay. So they're seen by a bunch of other people around the lake and, you know, stopping, doing things and whatnot. But then around 6 p.m., a lady, Miss Stanley, like, saw them going into this south bay of Big Moose Lake. Okay. And it's, like, secluded, like, it's basically all swamplands back there. Mm -hmm. Except for one area, I'm burpy. I don't know why. I love it. Okay. I know you burp into the mic all the time. I know. I (laughs) know. One area of the lake, back in the day, there was um, this logging thing that happened, and all these trees were felled, and so it was almost like its own natural dock. Okay. Right? So, Miss Lady sees them going into this deal. Miss Lady. <laughs> and she hears a scream oh, no. that she says sounds like a woman. Okay. 
And it's like not long after. And then it was also noted that Chester like put all his shit on the boat. His tennis racket and yeah, his tennis camera. Racket. And, and I can I can I point out something? At not one point during this whole trip has he played tennis. Okay, I was gonna ask that. <laughs> I was going to ask, like, what are we actually doing? But also, like, on a boat? Like, what are we fucking doing? And his suitcase. Like, he said that he had lunch packed for him. Okay, that I can understand. And the camera. But the tennis racket? Like, you need that on a boat right And your now. coat and your hat and Your everything. umbrella? Yeah. Your case? Everything. Uh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Oh, my God. This poor woman <laughs> is just getting fucking swindled left and right. Right? Right. Oh my God. right. Okay. So there's the scream. And then at one place I read, like, somebody saw him rowing towards that dock area. Okay. Now, I don't know if that happened after the scream was heard or if, like, they saw him rowing towards, they went out of sight, and then the scream was heard. Did they see two people in the boat at that time? I don't know. Oh, okay. With the research and the places. Okay, got it. didn't it. really say that. Mm. So, um, so, I'm trying to think of how to, because. Do you need to take a recess? No. <laughs> okay. We'll go with this. We'll go with this. Okay, so, at the next day, July mm-hmm. 12th, the proprietors noticed that the boat hadn't been returned. Okay. So, they send the steamboat out to look for it, and they find the boat. Or no, they went out to look for it, and they found the boat overturned in that South Bay Mm -hmm. with Grace's coat laid over the bottom of it. Oh, no. Right. Mm -hmm. So they're like, oh, my gosh. So they convince a steamboat to go and look for her body. And she's found in that that area of the lake, and it's like maybe nine feet deep of water. Uh By the way, she also mentioned in her letters that she can't swim. Oh no. Yes. What yes. A fucking piece of shit. Oh, just wait. Okay. So they they find her brother and then they found his straw hat, which by the way had the labels removed mm. that would help you find out where it was purchased. Right. Right. And it's floating in the water over there. Right. Like he drowned too. Right. Oh. Mm-hmm. So they're looking for him, all of these things. Well, because they'd found the body, it was now a homicide. So this defective, the the defective, exactly, the defective detective (laughs) was like on the case, right? Uh huh. And he happened to run into one of. Oh, wait, sorry, sorry, Grace, Grace's body. Uh Let's just let's discuss the condition that it was in when she found. I know it's sad. This could be some trigger warning. Okay, okay, okay. Her lips were swollen, Mm -hmm. and the right central incisor tooth was loose in its socket. The cartilage in her nose was flattened. Oh no! The wound on her eye, and this was on the right side, um, caused all of the blood vessels to burst, and her eye filled with blood, therefore blinding her. Oh my god! And so that she couldn't see, and both of her head wounds, she had, I think there was one on the left and one on the right, but both of them essentially were so harsh that it caused, like, blood vessels to pop in the brain, and there was signs of, yeah. So she was hit really hard. Right, Mm -hmm. right. And also, Miss um, Proprietor Lady, Uh she, when looking at the boat, apparently found two pieces of hair. On either side of the boat in the oar locks. And she brought them to the detective and like, here, these are Grace's. So the detective's like, okay, take some. And they're going on from there. So in the search, they're finding out, they find this guy, Bert, right? And Bert's the one that Chester sent the letter to asking him to forward the $5 to. Okay. Bert hears about the murder, knew that Chester was with Grace, and so he's worried that Bert's or Chester's drowned. So he heads up. So on the way up, the detective and Bert are traveling together. And the detective finds all this out. And Bert apparently knew, you know, about the whole relationships and reveals all of that. Did he know about the pregnancy and all of it? Um, I don't know. Okay. I think he did. Okay. I think he did. So, because if he knew they were together, you know what yeah. I mean? Mm-hmm. I don't know. So... The detective's like, oh, really? Because dude registered under a different name. They weren't looking for Chester Gillette, right? Right. 
They had some other dude. Right. And they knew the fact that they, Chester had asked for the $5 to be forwarded to Old Forge. Mm-hmm. So guess where they went to look for Chester? Old Forge. Yes, indeed they uh, did. Did they find him there? So now we went from Grace's story. Let's move to Chester mm-hmm. after the whole thing. So Chester, according, <laughs> according to Chester, uh. when he was questioned, it was all an accident. Like, he was like, oh, there was things. He was like, oh, she leaned over to grab, a, you know, a lily, a water lily, and the boat turned, and we were both thrown into the lake. Or, you know, she did this, and I went after her, and it turned, and she went, and we both went into the lake, you know? Uh-huh. And it was all of these just accidents, right? Yeah. And so... But it was several different uh-huh. sayings of how it happened. And she just has severe head trauma, and I don't know why. It obviously mm. happened when she fell out of the boat. She probably... I, I, mm-hmm. I, yeah, mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, beca- yeah. Mm-hmm. So, he also was saying, like, they were like, okay, well, if you were in the lake, how come your suitcase is completely dry? Mm-hmm. And there's no damage to the clothing you know all of these things so let's let's go for this so the defendant i'm going to read now the defendant after he did all this next he took a felt hat from his suitcase made the short distance from the shore to the road leading to eagle bay and within two hours from the time last seen by mrs barrett was observed carrying the camera tennis racket and suitcase and with a pair of canvas leggies on, leggings on, well away from Big Moose Lake and approaching Eagle Bay. So here's the thing. There is a road that's behind, this south end road, that you can either go right and go back down to the Big Moose Lake, or you can go up and end up at this Eagle Bay where there's a boat over to the place where he's meeting the girls. Oh, got it. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's about a six-mile walk. Okay. So no problem for Mr. Gillette, right? Sure. Uh-huh. So, and he was seen by a guy, and he's wearing these trousers, right? Like like things that you would use to walk in the woods. Okay. Not suit pants, not like he'd changed his clothes. Uh-huh. Anyways, so he reaches a... In- <laughs> when- <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so when he reaches Eagle Bay, the racket was no longer with him. And when he was initially questioned, he said that the racket was on the bottom of the boat when it tipped and was probably in the water somewhere. Mm-hmm. Then his story changed to, it was too cumbersome to bear, so I left it in the woods. In fact, it, he left it 100 feet away from the trail uh, under a log with moss and shit put on. Over that's it. very specific. <laughs> I'll, okay, well, that's what they found. So one of the one of the guys, right, while he was in prison, I know I'm all over the place, but one of the guys while he was in prison told him that there was a reward out for whoever found the racket. Oh, my God. He's trying to get the reward for his own crime. So he, Fucking Chester, that's not how that works. <laughs> of course you know where it is. <laughs> so he tells him where it is. He, is he going to get that on his commissary or, like, what the fuck are we doing? <laughs> Jesus, I don't know what happened after that transaction. Oh, I just like, you know what? I would really like some Doritos in here. You can find the racket under some moss. I'll take my reward. (laughs) What's the split we're going with here? What is it? This guy is fucking stupid. Okay. Oh, Lord. So not only, so when he got to the, when he got to his hotel, Mm -hmm. He unpacked his suitcase and he called for food, which was furnished by this boy who took the food from him or to his room and he found him eating an orange, you know, Uh evidently that he'd brought him with him. Okay. And like, he's chill. So the next- He's chill. Yeah. He's (laughs) chilling with his orange. Mm -hmm. And the next day he leaves the hotel at an early hour and did not reappear until night fell. So all this time he's going around exploring the area, taking pictures- (laughs) Hanging out with the peeps. He gets those two ladies. Uh, He ends up meeting up with them eventually. Yeah. I think it was the next day or something. Right. Mm -hmm. He even went to like this post office and he was asking the guys, like, so have you seen these ladies? Are they here? And he's like, 
oh, yeah, they went up to this mountain. He goes, oh, I was just there yesterday. He was like, well, then you should have sen- seen him. And he's like, oh, I, yeah, I thought I might have seen him, but I wasn't sure, you know, so. Just trying to be, like, super slick about it. Like, oh, I, I just, <sighs> whatever, Chester. Mm-hmm. So, are that's you okay? okay. Yeah. Okay. I told him to bring my purse in. Oh, I appreciate you. Thank okay, you. Okay, gotcha. Um, <laughs> he's the best. I'm constantly texting him from in here. Like, I ran out of wine. <laughs> Bring anyway, some more. sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. So <laughs> while he's at the hotel, too. Oh, he checks in under his own name. Mm. Yeah. Oh, now that he's rid of her, he can be his authentic self. Right. Okay. Right. Great. He's all hobnobbed with other hotel guests mm-hmm. and they're telling stories, doing all this stuff. And they're told about Grace's body being found in the lake. Mm -hmm. And he acts like this is a big shock to him. And what? I didn't know that happened. Oh, my God. Like, oh, how tragic, you know? What a piece of shit. Oh, yeah. Okay. (laughs) So then, of course, the police show up. Like, listen, we know, you know, what happened. Oh, it was an accident. Oh, this, that, or the other. His ass gets arrested and Mm. taken to jail. Good. Right. Mm -hmm. So... Here we go. Mm-hmm. We're going to go. The trial. Here we go. Herkman County Attorney George W. Ward moved Ooh. quickly on the case because he was running for job, judge. Oh, God. Yes. And he wanted this big case to help his I fucking campaign. hate that. There's nothing worse than a prosecutor with an agenda. Oh, you would know working in the court system as you did. Oh my god! Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So he pushes the case to be moved forward because mm-hmm. if it goes how it normally would, it would be after the election, and and then it won't be his case. And blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah. So the case was tried in four months from the murder and took three weeks. Mm. Okay. So here's the other thing. Mr. County Attorney George Ward Mm -hmm. was quite the showman. Of course. So he was going to the press and talking about all these things. And, uh, oh gosh, there's some of them I have quotes here and I got to find them because he was out of control. (laughs) Oh, balls. Well, Stupid. Okay, anyways, he was basically, he would call George or Chester this wolf. And he was this big wolf that was stalking her. And and oh, I've got to find this because the way he said it was so out of control. Because he, oh, come on, Allison. I'm so sorry. I feel unprepared. I'm Stop unprepared. it. All of this can be edited. Okay, Everything good. is editable. Okay, good. Okay, here here was his some of his things. And this was kind of in his closing argument. Uh-huh. So to give you an idea, or could have been the press too. But so here we go. When her last cry rang out over the waters of the lake, there was a wis- witness to that, and she will be there, stating she'll be there at the, at the case. Mm-hmm. His witness was the lady that heard the scream. Okay. That's in- not a witness. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so yes, he also would call Chester a rat and a predatory wolf, and and says he comes to you and looks out of those wolf eyes and the fiendish wolf that had stolen and forced the deceased. He was a wolf with ra- raving fangs. He claimed that Chester had committed rape and that Grace was ravaged by and pro- and the scoundrel. And he was just there to force and rape her. He claimed that the defense team called her a paramour. And par, how do you say that? What? Paramour? Paramour? Paramour, yep. Uh, and, param, AP Babaras. Just like that. <laughs> oh my God. I fucking love it. <laughs> you don't like long A's. <laughs> Your mouth doesn't like it. I don't like words. I don't like words. <laughs> words are hard. That are that are messed up spelling. Sure, I mean, sure, it's sure. Just... <laughs> Anyways, okay. In a process, which they didn't. Mm-hmm. So, um, and then he said at the closing studio, he says, no matter what the facts are, 
he maltreated a girl and we will punish him for that. Well, that is very theatrical, but he's also not wrong. Yes, Mm -hmm. I agree. And we're going to kind of, yeah, discuss because there was one really dramatic one, too, because he was like, he did this and he thought there was no eye upon him. Oh. But there was. Dun, dun, dun. Oh. No, there wasn't. There was an ear upon him. <laughs> Literally, there was no eye upon him. I know, right? Jesus Christ. I know. He was hell. Okay, so not so due to this, like all the shit, right? The press is going to town mm-hmm. on this stuff. Talk about so there are actually reporters that disguised themselves, went into the prison. <sighs> mm-hmm. Convinced the prison mates that they should, they called for a lynching of Chester. Oh, my God. That Chester should be lynched. Jesus Christ. And then when it happened, they'd go and report about it. Okay. Too far. Too fucking far. We have a problem in this country of trial by media that we've always had. In other countries, you're not even allowed to report on a case when it's still pending trial. Well, that's, yeah. And that's where, and I watched an instance interesting program about i swear to god i have not drinking very much wine. <laughs> sure you like that line from spain that we can't pronounce but it was about the lady who was trigger warning like gang raped in the bar i think jodie foster did a movie on it okay and it was like i got the impression that it was one of the first televised trials okay that they allowed the cameras into the courtroom mm-hmm Oh, and that shit's a hot mess. So Fuck. we won't even go there because, okay. you know, we got yeah. time here. So they basically, the prosecution, okay. They obtained the, the letters that Grace had written to Chester in his desk drawer mm-hmm. without a warrant. Oh, mm-hmm. perfect. And while the prosecution was gathering evidence and talking to the press and claiming to have an eyewitness to the events, no one was working on building a case defense for Chester. Yes. Oh. Finally, the county appointed him to a t- former t- uh, two attorneys, former Senate. <laughs> good Lord, Allison talked. Former state senator Albert Mills, who requested a younger man, Charles Thomas, who claimed to have not been paid very well at all. So they didn't really give their all to defend him. OK, like they mostly just brought character w- witnesses and then appealed everything you know, that was happening. I don't even know if it was the same lawyers, but, um, or d- objected to whatever evidence was brought. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So they had to admit, though, a lot of things, bad things about Chester. Sure. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's not soup's great. So, yeah. So they decided not to go with Chester's original story of it being an accident. Uh huh. I'm, she's grabbing for a lily pad. Yeah. Which, okay. I forgot to mention they did find. Lilies, water lilies. Well, I'm sure they did. In her coat pocket and on top of her coat. I know. But he could have put those there. (sighs) Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It doesn't seem like they had a lot of time. I think because they were on the lake for most of the day. And so they probably, they did gather the lilies, right? So Chester's lawyers decided not to go with Chester's first explanation made by him and given to the officers at Arrowhead, namely that while rowing about the lake on the boat had been upset in an accident. There were three different versions that he had given for the cause of the accident. I'm kind of repeating, but now I've got his versions. The first time he told me he was going up doing something with his hat and the boat upset. The next time I asked him, he said he stood up trying to reach upon Lily and the boat upset. The next time I asked him about the boat, was something afterwards, and he said he went back to her to talk with her and was crawling back in the boat, backing up, and the boat upset. Okay. Yeah. So he also, about the suitcase, said that he, because they were like, why is it dry? Coming back there. Okay, Uh why was it dry? And he also, gosh, I'm sorry I'm jumping everywhere, but he also took a pair of pants to the hotel concierge mm-hmm. and said they'd gotten a bit damp and he wanted them ironed out. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so he said that he brought the luggage out so that they can have a picnic and eat. And then he says he comes back and, you know, mm-hmm. now this new story. So, which is that he said that 
because of the letters, she was so depressed and everything that he was having a conversation with her Mm -hmm. saying, you know, we can't continue on this way. We need to, um, okay, here he goes. Instead of going straight across, he went way up toward the east and south of Bay to get some pond lilies. Those we had gotten in the morning were all withered and dried. We went up and got some pond lilies. These people talk weird. Like her letters are weird. <laughs> it's like old weird. timey talk. It's yeah. something I don't know. Should yeah. I rode around <laughs> <laughs> uh, or floated around at a short time? Well, kind of drifted, and then while well, Grace and I got to talking. We got to talking about what we ought to do. I asked her what she thought we had better do. I said, I didn't think we ought to, or that we could keep on as we had been, keep on going as we had been. And I thought we ought to do something. Like, it's obviously he's stuttering, you know, yeah. right? Well, yeah. I, I think, I mean, you know, like as we can be. And, and see, I asked her what she thought we had better do. She said, I don't know. Or I do not know. We will go down to Fourth Lake as planned and then go back to Utica or whatever you want to do. I told her that I did not think that we ought to. I did not think we had better whatever. Um, I finally said I think the best thing we could do would be well to get her home and tell her father and mother just everything which had occurred and explain to her why I thought we might better do that than to have them find it out as they would find it out anyways and she said she could not tell her mother. Then she started crying. So he's just talking in circles. Yeah. yeah. He says, I spoke up and I said she would not have to tell them. I would tell her father about it. I thought if I explained everything to him and went to him, why, it would be all right then. And then he would forgive us. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> you are, Yeah. Because you're just the bee's knees, Chester. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Man to man. Talking man to man. Man to man. Knocked up your daughter. <laughs> Couldn't keep my dick out of her. Yeah. Sorry. Turned her over in a boat and then went to meet other women. <laughs> I mean, right? fuck off, dude. Oh, yeah. <coughs> well, then she said, well, you do not know my father. You could never could tell him. And then I said... What shall we do then? We cannot keep up this way. And then she said, well, I will end it here. And she, well, she jumped into the lake. Okay. Yeah. Stepped up onto the boat, kind of throwed herself in. Mm. I tried to reach her. I learned, I leaned back in the seat to the other end, the boat seat, I guess. I tried to reach her then. And well, I was not quick enough. I went into the lake, too. The boat tipped over as I started up, or when I started to get up, the boat went right over them. And, of course, I went into the lake. Mm-hmm. Sure. Well, the only reason, well, not the only way out. The only reason why this is sort of working for him is that she has that history of talking about wanting to die. Which is exactly what the defense was going for. Yeah. Okay. And the character was just like, he, Chester would never be this. Sure, He's of course. such a good boy. Sweet baby Chester oh, with his yes. tennis racket. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. So they, let's see, he stayed there for 15, 20. Okay. So he, he was asked about the contents of the suitcase and how they had remained dry. He had not thought about having to explain this. So he declined to answer at first. This was when he was being questioned. Oh, I didn't right? prep for this question, so I'm not going to exactly. answer Exactly. I'm sorry. <laughs> and then evidently the necessity of explaining the condition mm-hmm. of the suitcase and its rescue by him while abandoning the girl according to his own theory of an accident upsetting the boat, he had, had just not had, had occurred to him. Like, why would I have to do that? So then after a couple of hours, he came back with the story. That he stayed there from 15 to 20 minutes, went to the shore of the South Bay and went on shore, went about 50 feet from the shore and sat down. That he then got his suitcase, took it out of the on the shore and got some luncheon from it and says, he says he further, it was kind of damp there. Grass was wet, so I fixed the suitcase near a tree and she sat on that. I then got... um my coat and it was the gray top coat and gave that to her and she read her lunch for about an hour and and he says when I got out of the boat I took my camera and when and we then got into the boat and rode away from the south bay into the lake and rode about the lake stopping at different points and landings eventually returning up to the south bay okay so he just left that all there sure 
But there's another point where he says his racket and umbrella were in the bottom of the boat, and those fell into the boat, yeah, into the lake. But uh-huh. he had the umbrella. So, um, yeah, it was just, he's all over the place. And there's one point he talks to the, the this guy, and he's like, you know, I am just, I'm really upset about this. I didn't, they're finding, I'm not confident in my defense team because, the prosecution are finding all these details, you know, Ugh. that he didn't think they were going to find. <laughs> no shit, Chester. It's called evidence. That's what they're supposed to do. Oh, my God. This guy is fucking dumb. <laughs> so then, it, so it said that, no, it definitely happened. The prosecution, because there was a point, like, he was back and forth whether he was going to marry her. Like, he was like, this is the love of my life. I was going to marry her. And they were like, then why did you just walk away? Yeah. You know, and apparently he had a map in his pocket that showed him the trail to get to the hotel, that uh-huh. everything. And he, the defense said, oh, he was just in shock. Okay. But your your girlfriend just commits suicide. Uh-huh. And you're just like, oopsie daisy, I'm in shock. I'm going to go hang out in the hotel, eat an orange. First, I'm going to stuff know. my tennis rock racket under some moss. Well, yeah, you know, and then, turn in my trousers um, to be mm-hmm, pressed mm-hmm. and eat an orange. Yeah, 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 and yeah. not say anything and act like they're shocked. Sure, right. So then it's also they say up until this point that the prosecution pulled this like freaking whammy of a disgusting maneuver. Mm-hmm. Trigger warning. Mm-hmm. They pulled the four month old fetus. Oh no! Out of Grace's body. They put it in a jar. Oh, my God. Brought it into the courtroom. No. Yeah. No. And they say it was covered, but there was a section of it that was open. Oh, my God. Why? So the jury could see. To prove that Grace was pregnant. Jesus Christ. Because up until the point, Chester, Chester hadn't. There's not a better way. Oh, my God. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, needless to say, that was a maneuver that the defense, like, said no. Mm-hmm. You know, that shouldn't have happened. Yeah. Okay. So, they... Okay. He says, well, after I changed my clothes, why I strap off into the woods again, kind of away from the lake. I went through a barbed wire fence and kept on going through the woods until I struck a road past two men and kept, two men and kept right along this road. I changed my suitcase and hung it over my shoulder. After that, I had to carry the racket in my hand. I carried that a short distance. It kept getting in the way. Uh, it, w- it was mean to handle. It says, when did you put it from the road? Why, I don't know how far. I guess 75 feet, <laughs> 50 feet perhaps. But near the f- put it near the first log I came to anyway. I put it down behind or beside a log. I don't think I put it under the log. Then I pushed some dirt down over it and left it. Okay. (laughs) That makes perfect sense. Oh, my God. And then, of course, when they find the racket, it has, like, a broken handle. Some of the strings were broken on it and everything like this. So are they thinking that's what he hit her with? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. I wonder if she had any markings on her face of, like, the squares. Like a tennis racket. I don't think have. so. So okay. here's the thing. They were back and forth with the coroner reports, right? Mm-hmm. Because the first coroner said, like, oh, yeah, she had some abrasions, bruises, whatever. Mm-hmm. And then he came back and was like, oh, no, she was severely beaten. Okay. You know? And the defense said they were going to bring in another coroner to counter, like, yeah. all this shit. But they never did. This is a little shitty defense team. Okay. Right. Mm-hmm. But there was signs of her drowning. Right? Okay. But the coroner says that the wounds that she had were so severe that they would have knocked her unconscious. So when she goes into the water, she's unconscious. She's inhaling. She's going to drown. Gonna drown. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. The little hair pieces that they had, uh, her sister cut off a lock of Grace's hair, brought it to the prosecution, and they compared it. Like, look, that's the same color hair. Mm-hmm. This is Grace's hair. It was on the side of the boat. Mm. All these things. Mm-hmm. They, the lady that testified of hearing the scream, the defense was like, "This could have been an am- animal, a small child." Oh you know, God, you're mm-hmm. not a scream expert. How can you say all these things? Okay. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. So he 
Oh, he also said that his watch had stopped mm-hmm. because it had gotten wet. Sure. It was fine. Okay. It was... I know. There's just a bunch of bullshit. So so they read all of these things. So during the trial, call, uh, he called Chester. I saw all that stuff. So they also read the letters after the closing argument. Uh, they read Grace's letters. They were supposed to only be admitted as to establish that they had a relationship. Okay. Um, but nothing beyond that. But they were reading all of it. Okay. You know, and the defense said, or the judge said, well, if you didn't want some things kept out, then you should have said what you wanted kept out. Mm-hmm. And you never did. Right. So they read these letters at the closing statement and like there was not a dry eye oh. in the courtroom. Everyone was crying. Except. For fucking Chester. For fucking Chester. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So Chester was also tested, like psychologically tested, mm-hmm. and was found to be sane. Okay. However, it's, he could have had like a, like narcissistic oh, social sure. disorder. Yeah. He right. could totally be sane and still, still be, be a that. fucking piece of shit. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Exactly. So he is, <laughs> per- well, okay. So on December 5th. Mm -hmm. 1906, after nearly five hours of deliberation, the jury had a unanimous verdict of guilty. Good. The thing is, it actually didn't take them that long. They said that they kind of stayed there longer to... Make it look like they were doing their due diligence in there. (laughs) Right. And really they were doing like crossword puzzles. Sure. He's guilty. Yep. At yep, least they yep. had the wear right, with all the do- <laughs> Like, well, I guess we better just hang around for a little bit. So it looks like we discussed something. Right. <laughs> God. So, um, so he was guilty of murder in the first degree. And he was sentenced to death by electric chair. He was reportedly calm and even smiling when his sentence was read. Oh. <sighs> Yeah. Psycho. Okay. So his friend Bert and his mom tried to raise money for him for appeals and they were basically unsuccessful. I guess his mom went to all these places and was basically just ranting and raving about the coroners and defaming Grace's character. God, this poor woman. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So, and she finally got to the point where... (laughs) At one point, she got so desperate that she said Grace had epilepsy, and that is what caused her to fall out okay, of the boat. Okay, relax, Mama Bear. <laughs> I fucking hate parents that are like, my sweet little Chester would never. It's he like, wake the fuck up. That. He did. I, I mean, he fucking did. See, and here's here's the shit that gets me, right? Because on a lot of the websites that I read, they were like, nobody will ever know the truth. Except for Chester. And I'm like, who the fuck could think anything else? Yeah. But this man is guilty. Yeah. Uh-huh. Like, you know, it's this unsolved. I mean. It's not. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So the lawyers appealed the verdict with a record-breaking 3,000-page document. Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah. And basically everything was like, yeah, no. Everything leads to this guy's guilty, not going to happen. Mm-hmm. So Chester apparently thought that he should have, he was like shocked because he felt like he should have received a full pardon. Of course he did. You know, because <laughs> <'cause> he's Chester. <laughs> His plan was so great, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and then before, he also in his diary said something to the effect that, oh, this is just going to be a new adventure and a new place to go. And okay, like, Chester. he wasn't even, yeah. Well, and fine. Uh, right? Mm-hmm. Own it. And it was said that he confessed to his priest person to, oh. and he said there was no legal mistake. Okay. That's what he said. Yep. But he never mentioned Grace and his children, except once, never talked about murdering or right. never talked about any of that. Mm-hmm. So... Um, so he was transferred to the Herkman County Jail, to the Auburn Prison, now Auburn Correctional Facility, where he was executed on March 30th, 1908 at 10.18 a.m. God. Yeah. And every witness reported that he went to his death more calmly than anyone else they had ever seen. Jesus And was Christ. very cooperative with the executioner. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And having no money, his family... Uh, had his remains 
cremated and his brain was given over to study in Philadelphia. Okay, as it should be. Mm -hmm. But (laughs) no one knows what ended up happening to Uh that. Maybe it fell into a lake. Uh Um, And Gillette's body was moved to a nearby Seoul Cemetery where it was buried in an unmarked grave. Mm. And according to celebrity grave enthusiasts, the plot had a road paved over it. Oh, Okay. And the exact location of the grave is now unknown. Wow. Wow. Fuck. Executions used to be so fast back in the day. Because he was convicted in 1906 and executed in 1908. Yeah. That would never happen now. It's mm. like, here's 20 years worth of appeals. Well, and they tried to, but the, yeah. the judge's like, no, that's all but bullshit. But it still wouldn't, like, yeah. that would never happen. And it shouldn't, right. but right. wow. But it's then just too, such you, a quick turnaround in right. these older cases. It's like, fuck. And you could see, though, where they had a point. Like, oh, her sister grabs some hair, and they're like, yeah, look, it's hers. Yeah. You know? I yeah, mean, totally. It just, it is Ugh. circumstantial, but yeah. still. Yeah, sometimes that's, that's all you got. Yeah. Wow. So here we go. There was a song written about the case, Entreating, by Maud Gould. It was published in 1907 with a picture of Grace on the cover. Okay. Also, <laughs> a word that starts with an A. Perfect. <laughs> I'm going to do it. Adirondack. Fold mm-hmm. song, 1925, The Ballad of Big Moose Lake. Mm-hmm. 1951, a movie called A Place in the Sun. Mm-hmm. 1920. Five novel, An American Tragedy. Wow. There is 1926 play and opera, same name, just to name a few. Wow. Yeah. Shit. Yeah. It also is said that there have been sightings of Grace's ghost around Big Moose Lake. I bet. Yeah. Oh, my God. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, my God. Are those your sources, sister? These are my sources. Tell me. Okay. I've got True Crime TV. Unsolved.com. Exactly. Dot com. <laughs> dot com. Murderpedia. I love Murderpedia. That a- Adirondack.net. Mm-hmm. Fresnostate.edu. And Wikipedia. Dang, sister. Yeah. Dang. Okay. Mm-hmm. I had to snap a picture of something and then I just texted Michael to start our dinner. Do you see what's happening in this household? I just sent a text to bring me my shit and start my dinner. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that Let's was fucking done. good. Right? Holy shit. I hate Chester. Right? Poor Grace. She I never got know. to meet her baby. She never... I know. I mean, and who knows? I mean, it's just... It's, it's so sad. I mean, when I was a kid, a young woman, I remember those times where... I knew the dude didn't like me, mm-hmm. but I was like, why? Why don't you like me? Mm-hmm. I want you to but like me. But in those times, too, where you have, like, you really will have, like, the scarlet letter mm-hmm. if you are uh, pregnant, you know? Yeah. You know? <sighs> but it's weird that she says, you know, I mean, one of those things she says, if my, you know, maybe if my... I come back dead and my oh, mom doesn't know. Yeah. Then it would it was like she was <sighs> God. So maybe she did, you know, maybe I, there is a book of her letters mm. on Amazon. I want to read that. I know me too. Mm. All right. Well, do you need a refill? That was real bleak. Thanks for that. I'm going to try and lighten the mood a little bit. I love this for us. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. I'll take a refill too, if you're pouring. So we had a conversation a few weeks ago about the Woodstock 99 Mm -hmm. and it reminded me of this chaos story that has been on my list forever. Nice. I finally did. So I'm going to tell you about the fire fest. Have you heard of the fire fest? Is that the one in California? Oh no. That's Mm -mm. the running man. Fire fest spelled F Y R E. Oh, okay. Fire festival. Okay. Like spelling matters to me. <laughs> but, okay, let's do it. <laughs> okay, so the fire festival. Let's let's start with Billy McFarland. Okay, let's. Twenty five year old Billy McFarland. He created an app called the Fire App. Okay. okay. The purpose of the app was to allow people to be able to book some of the biggest names in the music industry for performances all through this app. Okay. Okay. Hmm. He partners with Ja Rule, and he even gets investors on board to grow 
fire me. Right. Mm-hmm. He's like a... He's like trying to be a ticket master. Kind he's of an guy. entrepreneur. Okay. Entrepreneur. Okay. He's an entrepreneur. <laughs> he's so, nurse. He nurse. <laughs> he sets up this bougie office in Tribeca and has mm-hmm. a team of engineers working on the app. Okay. And his next step is marketing and advertising. So he wants to promote the app in a big way. Mm-hmm. And while he's on vacation in the Bahamas, he's like, hey, we should have a music festival. So... I think I might, but keep going. You might be familiar I with might. this. Yes. Oh, man. Keep going. <laughs> it's good. So there's a small island in the Bahamas called Norman Key. Mm-hmm. It's actually spelled C-A-Y, like K, but it's Norman Key. C? Language. What? Yeah. Well, you know. Yeah. I don't know. I okay. Don't, I know. I feel bad for people <laughs> who are trying to learn English because we can't even help you. <laughs> okay. The Island of Key. Mm-hmm. Let's hear it. Norman Key. It has a small airstrip, and he decides it's the perfect place to host his festival. Mm-hmm. So, two weeks later, he returns to the Bahamas with members of his team, including Ja Rule. Mm-hmm. And they go to work on planning this festival. Should I know who Ja Rule is? He's a rapper. Okay, got mm-hmm. it. All right. um, and Sorry. I think at this time, like... Sorry, Ja Rule. No, it's okay. He was, like, really big in, like, the early 2000s and then mm-hmm. kind of, like, teetered off a little bit. And so I think this was part of his attempt at bringing, bringing back. himself back. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and just for some context. So I didn't take a deep dive into Billy McFarlane because he's just a douche canoe. But he had previously <laughs> had another business. This is the kind of person that he is. Okay? A douche canoe. Yeah. yeah I'm sorry. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm gonna remember that one. Okay. His 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 business venture that he had prior to this that sort of failed was, and again, I'm summarizing the very little that I know about it, but basically, mm-hmm. like he's one of those people where like status is really important to him, which I think is gross, mm-hmm. just personally. Mm-hmm. And he knew that when people had the American Express black card. That that mm-hmm. was like, mm-hmm. that means you're the shit, right? Mm-hmm. So he had started... Because like no limit. Right. Yeah. He had started this company where basically it appears that you have the black card, but really it's attached to your debit card and looks like a black card, <laughs> right? <laughs> and for two, for a $250 annu- annual fee, it's supposed to Stop it. allow you the same perks as a black card, like getting reservations at bougie restaurants that are otherwise booked and all these things. But then what was happening is that people weren't actually getting the benefits that their $250 annual fee was paying for. And so that business venture sort of tanked and then he started fire media. Okay. Okay. So he's somebody that just wants to be in the top 1% with the elite and he wants to be whatever, but he also Mm. wants to cut corners. To get there. Yeah. We know these people. We do know these people. Yes. Yes. Uh-huh. Everything is about status and how fucking cool he is, right? Right. So, the island of Norman Key used to be populated by the cartel. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and rumor was that it was owned by Pablo Escobar. Mm-mm. hmm I know him. Yeah. 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 So island officials tell Billy McFarland that they will allow him to lease their island for the festival, but he is not allowed to promote it as being an island owned by the cartel or Pablo Escobar. Because oh, they are, I mean, they care about their culture. They care about their heritage. They care, right? This is the Bahamas. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. So Billy first pays out over a million dollars to hire Victoria's <laughs> Secret Models. Mm-hmm. To make a promotional video about the festival. Okay, wait a minute. Where is he getting this money? He has all these investors. Okay. He okay. has like Shark Tank level investors because oh, he's like, I've got this app and you can just like book Beyonce for like your private party on my app, which also wasn't fucking true. I was going to say, like, does he fucking know Beyonce or even her like... Right. Like... So he's he's okay. duped. He's, pulling, he's pulling a Chester here. Yeah, he's okay. duped people into investing in Shh. this. Right. Okay. So then he pays several social media influencers to simultaneously post about Firefest on Instagram. Mm-hmm. So it's like a scheduled, and I think it's like an orange square, and so it's like this obscure thing where everyone posts it at the same date and time. Okay, I don't know what an so, orange square is. So it like literally, it's just a picture of an orange square, so that people oh, will be like, I see. "What okay. is this?" <laughs> right? Okay. 
okay. <laughs> I'd be going on like that, stupid. Mm-hmm. You forgot your picture. <laughs> nice border, but wh- where's the post? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, me too. So, ticket prices start at $500 for basic entry and go up to $250,000 for a luxury yacht experience. So, he's basically advertising this as like Coachella, but a music festival. Like, this is for the elite. Uh Um, They're advertising private villas Mm -hmm. and food created by famous chef and restaurant owner Stephen Starr. Right? It's like, this is going to be like the bougiest fucking music festival you've ever been to. So did any of these promised people like hear about this and were like, Mm. um, oh, 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 okay, here we go, okay. Uh Yeah, yeah. Uh, It wouldn't be chaos if they had. (laughs) So. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So. Here we go. (laughs) The promotional video goes viral. And in the video, Billy McFarlane says that the island of Norman Key was once owned by Pablo Escobar. Mm. Because he believes it will add to the allure of the festival. Dick move. This guy just thinks his shit don't stink. Mm-hmm. So when island officials learn that he has done this, they revoke the contract and they tell him that they're not going to allow him to lease their island. Good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He moved forward anyway. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. At this point. Oh, you've listened to this podcast. No. The end. Um... <laughs> Wasn't that crazy? Not where? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. So, at this point, thousands of people have bought their tickets. Mm. Mm Mm-hmm. And they're promised a celebrity chef and private villas, right? And yachts. Okay. Yeah. Thousands of people. And it's four months away. And McFarlane needs to find a new island to host the event. (laughs) (laughs) After two months of searching, he finds a spot on Great Exuma which isn't a remote or private island. And the festival site, it's um, the spot that he was able to secure was an abandoned Mm. resort development (laughs) full of gravel and roads that lead to nowhere. (laughs) Not only that, I think this comes later, but I have to tell you now. When he sends out the notification of, like, the new island spot, he, like, does, like, a really shitty, like, photoshop job (laughs) he takes like an aerial picture of this spot that's not a remote island and then like erases the mainland around it so it looks like one is that one of your pictures i hope that's one of your pictures (laughs) it's like (laughs) and two like you know you would think with these people with all these money you know Mm -hmm. they'd be like Mm-hmm. That one's photoshopped to me. <laughs> well, there was some of that. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, go. But keep in mind, he's got like, like legit, like good fucking engineers working for him in Tribeca on oh, his app. So right. I don't know where he gets his resources or I mean, investors, I guess. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, so he leases this abandoned resort development. Um, he doesn't tell ticket holders that the location has been changed. Instead, he sends out an aerial shot of this abandoned resort development and removes the mainland around it (laughs) so it looks like a private island and he calls it fire island Mm -hmm. Mm, yeah yeah because this location (laughs) (laughs) i mean that would have been better (laughs) like that's really what we're dealing with is land that should just be set up in a blaze of glory so (laughs) okay here we go there's no infrastructure at all Mm -mm. So he has to build the festival from the ground up. Like, there's no plumbing. There's no electricity. It is, it is nothing. It is like gravel. That's about it. (laughs) No, no fancy. There's nothing. Huts or. No. So now he's two months away (sighs) and he's got a gravel strip. Okay. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So he goes to two local contractors for help and they both tell him that there is absolutely no way. That what he wants to have happen can happen in two months. They're like, that's a minimum 18 months and like $50 million (laughs) to even like 
to create private villas and like plates for places for like a luxury yacht experience to happen. Yeah, and, or like, Beyonce to, you know, yeah, get up no. on. I don't think Beyonce would be mm-mm. performing on some gravel. No. Uh-uh. This, mm-mm. Mm-mm. Yeah. But all these people have bought tickets and <laughs> some people. If you like it, then you should have put a face yeah, on I it. know. <laughs> <laughs> if you like it, then there should have been an infrastructure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so there's no contractors that'll touch this. They're like, fuck no. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, still, Billy, uh, he rejects the advice of people who know what they're talking about, and he keeps forging ahead. The Fire Festival is happening, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. On top of all this, the Fire Fest is happening on the same weekend as Great Exuma's biggest celebration, which is called Regatta, which is an annual boat racing event. So, because of this, there are no vacancies at any resort mm-hmm. or hotel mm-hmm. anywhere. <laughs> This is just getting better and better. <laughs> this guy. You go, boy. You go. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> Try to live your best life. <laughs> Fuck. This guy is so stupid. <laughs> so the fire Festival team, along with a whole bunch of day laborers from this island, are working around the clock to get the festival site built. Mm-hmm. This is sad. One local who, he's an electrician on the job. He was working for McFarland on credit. Mm. And paying his own staff out of his pocket. <gasps> no. Mm-hmm. What a deep mm-hmm. He finally tells Billy that he can't keep doing this. He has a family to feed and a mortgage. And Billy promises him that the money is on the way. And he even sends him a confirmation email um, oh, that sure. there's been a wire f- transfer right. that has been made. I've heard of con people doing that mm-hmm. shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> so... McFarland, he's burned through all of the investors' money and other investors that he thought he would be getting uh, funding from, like Comcast, pulled out as soon as they started to get wind that the Firefest was a shit hot mess. Good job, Comcast. Good job. Uh huh. Oh, Comcast. Yeah, <laughs> Comcast. Com- yeah. yeah, they yeah. weren't conned. They were almost conned. <laughs> I wonder what like is going through this dude's head. Like, does he really feel like he's going to pull this off? Like he he yeah. Up until the bitter end, he's like, I'm doing it. I'm going to wow. fucking figure it out. He's just got such an inflated sense of self that yeah. he thinks that it's going to happen. All right. Mm-hmm. Well, so, um. Other vendors are paying for things out of their own pocket because the Fire Media credit cards are being declined. And there's several materials that are brought over by ship for the festival that are being held at customs because of unpaid invoices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Now, how far away is this now from the festival that all this business is going on? Two months. Okay. We're two months out. Okay. Uh Alrighty then. Yeah. Two Mm -hmm. months and they're. It gets worse. <sighs> so he also owes millions on a string of short-term loans that are now due. Then the electrician and other local laborers who received the email of the wire transfer confirmation learned that the emails were phony. Mm-hmm. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, there was no fucking wire <laughs> transfer happening. Yeah. And um, McFarland, he created that document and sent it out to all the local laborers who were working for him that he owed money to, to keep them at bay for a little while. What a deep the bag. fuck? Yeah. Mm-hmm. What did you call it? A douche canoe? A douche canoe. He's, He's a, a freaking fucking douche, douche canoe. canoe. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so still our friend Billy here, he doesn't fold. Instead, he doubles, he double downs, doubles downed. Double downs. He, he if he's he double doubling, he, he doubles with nothing. So double that's or like, nothing. That's like zero times zero is zero. He's got. Uh-huh. I mean. Uh huh. Okay, let's go. Build. Zero times two is zero. So here's so. what he does. <laughs> okay. He sends emails out to all the ticket holders <sighs> because there's bracelets that you get mm-hmm. uh, for your entry, and he encourages all the ticket holders to load money onto their wristbands, onto their bracelets, because it's a cashless festival Mm -hmm. and he's telling him like hey there'll be like bottle service and vip tables and yoga and private cabanas and massages so load up money onto your wristbands so Mm -hmm. that you can just go in and beep beep and get a massage it sounds like it would be a blast if it actually happened Uh but yeah Yeah. Uh so a bunch of people do this and it brings in another two million dollars for him which is enough to pay off some vendors and keep this thing afloat Mm -hmm. right even though 
none of that is they don't even have yeah. they don't even have a place for people to sleep. And he's still saying, like, there's going to be massages, well, you know, there's going to be this, there's And here's gonna be that. the thing, though. So he already has the sales of the tickets mm-hmm. and the sales of the money, and it hasn't even happened yet, and he's in debt. How does he plan on making his money back? I, I know. I know. I think a lot of this is more like he's thinking that if he can pull this off, that he will be the new fucking it guy in entertainment. And his ample... His amp, his app will go. Yes, crazy. this is got all it. to promote his app, which he never even like <laughs> got permission from the artist to have this app, and it's a no go in the first place. But whatever, we're not getting into the weeds about it. That's oh, not the okay. point. Okay, okay, okay. And when you, oh my god, you can still watch the original promotional video, which was like uh, Kendall Jenner, mm. and it looks like if you want the bougiest weekend you've ever imagined Stop in your it. whole life, come to Firefest. He got her to do a thing like All that? these Victoria's Secrets mo- models, all these, like, Instagram and YouTube influencers did a commercial promoting oh, Firefest. Oh, that's right. And, like, this will be, yeah, yeah this will yeah. be a weekend of a lifetime. Get a massage, okay. watch Beyonce, have a five-star, yeah. um, you know, Michelin star meal. Person, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So on April 27th, 2017, it's 12 hours before people are set to arrive. And there's a tropical storm. (laughs) (laughs) The gods have struck down on Billy. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the festival site is drenched. It's a total disaster, but still Billy pushes forward of course billy Mm -hmm. does there's no private villas instead Uh, uh. there's a bunch of fema tents (laughs) (laughs) can you imagine paying tens of thousands of dollars and you get there fema fema tent and foam mattresses (laughs) (laughs) We're set outside, and now they're all soaked. <laughs> Did he have round-bottom rowboats instead of yachts? <laughs> There's no boats at all. There's no boats. <laughs> Fucking FEMA tents and foam. Not even, like, kayaks? <laughs> and not even enough for all the people. Oh, lordy. So at some point in time on that day... Uh, Blink-182, who was scheduled for this festival, starts to get wind that things are way fucking wrong. And so they withdraw from the festival and they sent out a tweet saying, quote, we're not confident that we would have what we need to give you the quality of performances we always give our fans. So they're not they're not coming. And that was the only band band that it booked. Okay, okay. And they're like. We're start. There's starting to be a buzz that this is a mess, and we're not coming. Right. So they've got okay. no music. They've got FEMA tents and foam. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So doggy paddling instead of yachts. <laughs> yep. Yep. Okay. So at this point, ticket holders they see the tweet, but they're already en route to the festival. They're mm-hmm. already on planes and they're headed there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's a shit hot mess at the airport. For the festival goers, because some of these people paid for what they thought was like a private jet to take them from Florida over to the Bahamas. Stop it. No, yeah. And there's just like thousands of people just like sleeping at the airport waiting to get. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. With like no flights. Uh-huh. So they all get to um, the little Exuma airstrip and they all load into a crowded school bus. <laughs> this first oh group of people God. that are on oh. the school bus come on they're first brought to an impromptu beach party <laughs> <laughs> where what? what happens what happens they're just given shot after shot after shot <laughs> 
for six hours, <laughs> hoping that they'll get drunk enough to not remember what they're supposed to be doing. <laughs> they'll get drunk enough to make these FEMA tents and air mattresses look like exotic resort cabins. <laughs> With massages. <laughs> FEMA tents. <laughs> So they're they're kept at this oh, beach party man. for six hours, okay. While they're still frantically trying to prep for this festival. Mm. Mm-hmm. I mean, at this point, really, like, what's the point? You know, mm-hmm. it's gonna be a shit show. It's gonna be a show shit up. show. No amount of alcohol. Mm. <laughs> so then, beach party people and all the people that arrived from the airport later, they're all loaded into the school buses, mm-hmm. and they're all taken to the festival site. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um. And they all learn as soon as they get off the school buses that their accommodations are a fucking disaster. Mm -hmm. It's FEMA tents, uh, dirt and gravel floors. Um, Some of them have wet mattresses. Mm -hmm. Some of them don't have, they don't have enough mattresses. Mm -hmm. So now people are fighting over wet mattresses and there's not enough FEMA tents either. And (laughs) this is my favorite. (laughs) I'm pre-showing you a picture. Okay. (laughs) it's like use your cash bracelet to upgrade to a butt mat. Uh, there's air nothing there. <laughs> the um, promised gourmet food was oh. two pieces of bread oh. with a slice of cheese and a small salad. Stop this is what one it. one person posted. This is what they got. <laughs> what? It's like two pieces of home fried bread and like American cheese. I was just gonna say. That's not even a good kind of cheese. It's like American cheese. Like a salad with no dressing. At least it's wheat bread. Oh (laughs) my god. So that's what they get. (laughs) Oh my god. Um, And then there's no, there's no musical act booked at all. Billy should have sang. So um, there's a couple of local musicians who were there for the festival who took the stage that evening and sang to kind of help keep the vibe uh-huh, happy uh-huh. Mm. by evening the ticket holders were fighting over tents and wet mattresses because there wasn't enough for everyone mm-hmm. and their luggage oh, there's a picture of this too was just being thrown out of shipping containers in the dark mm-hmm. and people <laughs> people were just scrambling around looking for their stuff in the dark as it's being just thrown out of shipping containers by fire fest <laughs> workers I can just imagine these, like, you know, when those, those days where like, shit, just everything's freaking going wrong. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it finally gets to a point where you just like have to crack mm-hmm. and just bust out hysterically laughing. Mm-hmm. They, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's just so bad. It's so bad. It's <laughs> it's so fucking bad. And these are people that are like. Yeah, super bouge. Super bouge. Yeah. So, also at the festival, there's no lighting, oh obviously, because the electrician wasn't paid and he fucking bounced. Mm. There's no medical staff. Mm. There's no cell phone service or internet service. There's not enough portable toilets. There's oh, no running water. Oh, no. And they have a very heavy handed security guard who's oh. just like, get in your FEMA tent. <laughs> All of a sudden, they're in, like, this prison camp or something. And then to top it off, the festival had been highly promoted as a cashless event. Yeah. With your bracelets. Yeah. So nobody's able to even pay for, like, an Uber or a taxi or they can't get out of there. Oh, my gosh. I didn't even think (laughs) of that. What the fuck? Okay, so they have no cell service. Mm -hmm. So can't reach out even to get money. Uh Uh-huh. It turns into, like, a full-blown, like, refugee situation. Holy (sighs) shit. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Is at least there a date, like, a boat scheduled to come and pick them up? or the school buses. Okay, the school buses are going to be taking them back Mm -hmm. at the end. Okay. Yeah. But but there's no private jets. Well, And these flights that they think are being booked are not, right? And there's all these people coming into town for, like, their annual, like, the biggest festival of the weekend. So. 
And it's not even an island, so they don't no. need a boat. Okay, so yeah, I forgot about that. Part. It is an island. It's just it's like a huge island. It's not a private island. Gotcha. It's, it's just still a, in the Bahamas. It's a tiny it's, part of this. It's a gravel strip on on Exuma. Mm-hmm. Okay. So for the attendees that were able to get self service, they took to social media showing videos of the festival and using hashtag fire fraud. I so want to find those videos. Oh, they're still there. Oh. Uh huh. And the following day, the festival disaster has made headlines around the world. Uh, yeah. And all these people are fucking stuck. And there's like a bunch of videos that are like, help me get out of Firefest. <laughs> Save me. Yes. <laughs> Message in a bottle. Get me home. Holding up signs. Yes. The passing plane. Yes. So fucking bad. SOS spelled yes. out on the... <laughs> So bad. So because of limited flights out of the Bahamas, people are stranded for days at the airport before they're finally able to get home. Oh my gosh. Uh On October, or in October of 2018, Billy McFarlane was sentenced to six years in prison in order to pay more than $26 million in restitution to the investors (gasps) and customers he defrauded. He reached a settlement with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission over fraud charges in July of 2018, agreeing to a lifetime ban on him as ever serving as a director or an officer of a public company ever again. He still has to pay the money back, though, right? but he's broke. So there's still still civil suits for the ticket holders and vendors. They're still pending. Yeah. Yeah. They're working on it, but he's broke. See, that shit, it's like, what's mm-hmm. the point of spending all this money on lawyers to try to get money out of a dude you obviously know doesn't have the money? Mm-hmm. Well, because what happens it is, like, even if he gets out and he's working at Burger King, eventually those wages will be garnished, and these thousands of people might get $5 <laughs> a month for the rest of their life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm sure that will pay back their lawyer fees real yeah, quick. I know, I know. So that was the wow. Fire Fest FEMA tents. That was freaking epic. <laughs> that was awesome. Oh, oh my gosh. Mm. I can't, you know, but it's one of these things with, with traveling. It's like, I feel like as long as you don't die, like, and people will obviously disagree, but the worst experiences are always the best stories. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So people were like, Fire Fest? Yeah, I was there. I was there. I saw that oh, shit. Yeah. I went down. Look at my video. You know I stayed I mean? in a FEMA tent on a wet mattress <laughs> and ate cheese bread. Yeah. I fucking did that shit. <laughs> you know, and it's one of those things, too, where it's like, this is going to sound way wrong, but like, do we feel bad for like, the bougiest people ever who had to experience like what rough camping for the week you know i and, but the my thought on that is is i mean i guess it just depends on a person's character uh-huh. there could be some bougie people that were out there probably laughing their asses off like oh my god look what just happened to us you know, because if they had that amount of money to mm-hmm. spend on something like this, mm-hmm. guaranteed that's not going to knock them out and make them broke. No. You know what I mean? But I, and, and, and to it, they're dealing with a criminal. Oh, I know. You know, it's not like, oh, we, their car broke down and they had to go in a tent and experience like tent. Like I know. Oprah I know. and Gail. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it's, yeah. It's, yeah. That was, that was a hot. Mess. It was a fuck. I do. I don't want to say that I don't feel bad for the people. I'm, of course, I'm not saying that. Right, I right. just am like, I spent, you know, all this and I'm in, you know. Well, it's that's just like, a definite, you know, that's a definite lesson for them yeah. to do maybe a little bit more research. Yeah, totally. they, you know, And, but it's of human nature to trust people. It friend. is. And it's also the thing of like Excuse when me. you're an influencer like Kendall Jenner and it's yeah. like make a video and put it on your Instagram. Okay. Well, it's it's propped up as this and big like, old, I'll pay you $100,000. Know? I right. think that's what it was for like the models oh, and the wow. whatever. And it's like, okay. He just was spending money like it was mm-hmm. like he had an endless, like he had a black American or Express yeah, card. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Wow. God. Anyway, yeah. He um, should, you know what he <laughs> Granted, it's too bad he's banned from being his own person because he could be like, 
I'll set up the worst possible experience for you ever. <laughs> oh my Oh my god! And It'll be like naked and afraid, no <laughs> Billy shit. style. There was a little <laughs> clip from this documentary I watched, and I didn't take a deep dive into this, but it was like he was out on bail, like pending trial, and uh-huh. while he was out on bail, he was selling like fake concert tickets. Like he is just. I would like to deep dive in this guy. Like, what is his upbringing? Like, what, like, what set him on this path? I don't know. I don't know. Of like, what the fuckness, you know? Yeah. What the fuckness. Real quick, my yes. sources. Okay. American Greed, uh-huh. season one, episode two, Wikipedia, BBC News, CNBC, New York Post, ABC.net, and allnewstead.com. Boom. <coughs> Boom. Boom. Yeah. Well, that's Firefest. Fuck. I encourage you to watch the promotional videos for Firefest. They oh, still exist. I will so. And I want to see the videos of the people that were there. The people that were taking, that were going on like Instagram live while their luggage is being thrown out of a shipping container in the dark. Oh my God. Were they laughing? No. They were like, what the fuck? Yeah. Oh, I see. I would be laughing my ass off just because it gotten to that point of like. (laughs) There was like (laughs) one couple that managed to get like a normal hotel room and they did like an Instagram live from their hotel room and they were like, what the fuck? Wow. Yeah. Crazy. Totally nuts. Oh my god! Oh my god! Well, fuck! Thanks for co-hosting with oh, me, sister. Yes, yeah, this was shit. So much fun. So fun. Do you have anything else? Um, just that I love you. I love you so much. I love you. Thank you for being my co-host. Thank you for inviting me to be your co-host. anytime. Uh, this was motherfucking chaotic. Bye. 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 Thank you for joining us on this episode of Crime, Wine, and Chaos. Artwork by Erica Peterson. Music by Paul Abner. Audio editing by Amber Clifton. We are on Facebook at Crime, Wine, and Chaos and on Instagram at Crime, Wine, and Chaos Pod. If you would like to support the show or submit a listener story, you can visit our website at crimewineandchaos.com for our Patreon link and listener story submission. Cheers!